Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thanks, everybody. So, yeah, I want to talk about lab monitoring in persons with HIV. So, uh, next slide. It's very exciting, but important. So, I'm going to go through sort of a continuum process. We have people in various stages who are patients, um, and then how do we monitor labs across this continuum? So, we set up uh, this sort of the way of thinking of us. So you have someone who comes in who's HIV negative and they're at risk and or they're alive and they need to get tested for HIV and uh, different tests that are available are like rapid HIV antibody or a combination HIV antibody and antigen or perhaps even an RNA test of someone who's high risk and you're suspecting um, very acute infection. Um, so those would be the ones that we would run for uh, those people who are HIV negative. And then there's also these um, safety labs, co-infection screening, et cetera. This would be where uh, it's really about co-infection screening, such as sexually transmitted infections, viral hepatitis, et cetera. Um, next slide. And then we have people who are who should be on prep, um, and then getting a rapid HIV antibody test there is good. Um, and then at the time of prep, we also recommend getting a um, combination HIV antigen antibody test or an RNA test. But you don't need to wait for those results before um, going ahead and starting those prep, going ahead and starting the prep. But then you also need to get safety labs and the co-infection screening, and we're going to talk about that more when we do the the prep section. Next slide. So there's also people who will come in wanting post-exposure prophylaxis, and it's similar. We want to get the HIV antibody test um, rapid, if possible, before the PEP, and then to get the uh, combo test or an RNA test um, before starting the PEP, if possible, um, but you don't need to wait for that uh, result. And then co-infection screening is also important. Next slide. And then at HIV diagnosis, so somebody comes in, they're diagnosed, it's a good time to get a viral load, which is the HIV RNA test, get a CD4 count. Uh, we still recommend getting an RT uh, protease genotype. Um, and then we get lots of questions every year. Should somebody get a pre-treatment um, integrase genotype test? And this year, we're recommending it if they had a partner who was failing uh, therapy with an NST. So there is a, a good chance that they perhaps got transmitted drug-resistant virus with a uh, integrase inhibitor. Um, and then also adding this year is a cryptococcal antigen test that we'll talk about in a second if the CD4 count comes back less than 100. And then to continue to get the safety labs based on um, the person's condition, et cetera, and screening for co-infection. But uh, of noted, you don't need to wait to start somebody on therapy for a lot of those uh, safety labs, co-infection labs, unless somebody had pre-existing kidney disease, et cetera, that you need to sort out that. If, if there's not really suspected, then we don't we don't want you to wait a long time for those results if, if necessary to start therapy. Next slide. And then during uh, therapy, you do the HIV RNA test. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about when and how often that you do it. Uh, definitely, we want you to start, we want you to test uh, for a viral load within four to six weeks after starting. Um, depends on how fast you can get your RNA levels back, your viral loads back, um, and when they can come in to see you. But uh, about a month is a good rule of thumb. And then uh, during therapy, we, we suggest that we recommend that CD4 counts continue every six months until 250 or above for a year, and then they, they can be stopped. And then continuing the co-infection and um, STI testing and safety labs. Um, next slide. And then uh, it happens um, that uh, at uh, virologic, we'll find somebody who has virologic failure, which is two uh, measures greater than 200 copies per mil, um, two different measures at greater than 200 copies, and we call that virologic failure. And at that time, we recommend getting a CD4 count, a genotype, um, the RT protease. If they are on integrase inhibitor, um, go ahead and get the integrase genotype at that, that time and then continue with the STI screening, et cetera. Next slide. I think that's... It. So I tried to simplify this as much as possible to think about uh, sort of this lab continuum of our uh, participants. But we have a, a few things on there, and I'd like to start off the comment, um, Raj, if you don't mind telling us about CD4 counts less than 100 and CRAG, because you know, we had a lot of discussion about that early on, 
And um, the data looked really good for us to put it in the recommendations, but it is new to us. If I can pick up it for a second. Would, um, sure, it is new, and I would say um, I'd love Dr. Benson also to comment, but I think a lot of this data has come from places where um, – uh, cryptococcal meningitis is one of the leading causes of, of death. And so, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, cryptococcal meningitis is second only to tuberculosis in terms of its frequency as an opportunistic condition. Um, in that setting, uh, there are um, good data that screening people with low CD4 counts, remember cryptococcal meningitis is largely a disease of people with CD4 count less than 100, that pe- screening those people with a cryptococcal antigen allows you to to pick up undiagnosed cryptococcal infection. Um, it may not yet be meningitis, but it might be um, pulmonary crypto or it might be cryptococcal on infection on its way to meningitis. And then by virtue of detecting them, then you can do the appropriate next steps, which is assess them for neurologic symptoms, assess them for evidence of meningitis, and then in some instances do a lumbar puncture because as we heard earlier in the in the day, if you diagnose cryptococcal meningitis, you absolutely need to treat it, typically with amphotericin-based therapies. Um, but then you uh, will adjust the timing of starting your antiretroviral therapy. Um, so in those settings, when people have done screening cryptococcal antigen testing in people with CD4 counts less than 100, uh, they have picked up undiagnosed crypto, and then they've been able to, you know, uh, improve um, uh, outcomes. And so what I will say about the cryptococcal antigen test is it's a very, very, very specific test. So if you have a, a positive test in a person with HIV, you, you have a very solid evidence that they have cryptococcal infection. There are very few causes of, of false positive cryptococcal antigens, and, and that's what you need in a, in a screening test. If you have a screening test with a lot of false positivities, then you then you go awry. So I, I think we endorsed it in part because of the ability that it is a specific test. If you find it, it, it will impact your, your clinical management, and, um, and, uh, and that was part of the rationale. But maybe Dr. Benson wants to pick it up from here or anyone else wants to. I know Dr. Sachs also probably has um, thoughts on this because when we were discussing it, he was one of the ones who raised it. So maybe Connie. So one of the controversies associated with this uh, approach has been the fact that most of the studies that looked at it were done in resource limited settings where there's a much higher rate of cryptococcal disease and uh, less ability to adequately treat it when it occurs as symptomatic disease. I think um, the only thing I would really add to your discussion is there was one study uh, done in the U.S., a large study published by the CDC, actually, that showed a rate of cryptococcal antigen, asymptomatic cryptococcal antigenemia in this population of CD4 counts under 100 that range from 2 to 4%. So lower than you see in resource-limited settings, but still a substantial rate even in the U.S. where um, presumably people are exposed less and have more options. But having said that, that study also included people that may have gotten cryptococcal antigen tests done at the time they were being diagnosed with cryptococcal disease. So I think... It's a little bit of a muddier picture in the U.S., but I think the data are very convincing for um, lower resource settings where most of these studies have been done that show improved survival when you um, initiate antiretroviral therapy and preemptive treatment for cryptococcal disease when you pick up asymptomatic cryptococcal, cryptococcal antigenemia. And more importantly, that picking it up, even in people who may not be um, fully symptomatic with cryptococcal meningitis, affords you the opportunity to screen them for cryptococcal meningitis or more serious disease and actually get them started on therapy. And that also improves survival. So I think there's ample evidence that you can improve outcomes by screening for this and preemptively treating or doing a full diagnostic workup for cryptococcal disease. And um, that's really all I would add to a comments you've already made. Yeah, let me jump on because in my really earlier life, I guess, in HIV, I'd worked a lot with crypto, and almost all the cases were advanced meningitis on presentation. And then, of course, we've got to use amphotericin B up front and – 
um, that is that's difficult for uh, you. So the point is, if we catch it early, as, as Dr. Benson was just saying, we can treat with fluconazole, and it's once you've ruled out the, the the meningitis. So the way it would go is you screen for the cryptococcal antigen. If you're one of that the patients, one of that two four percent, then you would do an LP. That's going to be you do a CT scan, then an LP. And as you get the LP results back, if that cryptococcal serum, sorry, CSF antigen is negative, then you're clear to use fluconazole. You might also check a chest X-ray because sometimes there's um, asymptomatic pulmonary disease that you could pick up. But it, it just it will prevent the meningitis from occurring, which the natural history would suggest would go forward in that way. So it's, I think it's a very important um, new addition of the guidelines, a little subtle but important. And flipping that around, one thing that we don't have there that we used to was looking at toxoantibody. And I think that's because we just don't, A, see that much toxo at presentation, but others may want to comment on that. But we're not really recommending that anymore. Good point, uh Dr. Sachs, did you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that cryptococcal antigen is a very inexpensive test. Uh, and a single time test done at the outset of uh, diagnosis does not need to have very much um, usefulness to be cost effective because all it needs is just a few few cases that you pick up and help for it to be worth doing on a broad scale. Do we know what the natural history is of, uh, of these cases if they have uh, crypto antigen but not meningitis and then start on ARV uh, and get a nice rebound in CD4? Does that itself control the, the kind of the relatively low-grade crypto infection? I think it probably uses, Mike said, fluconazole uh, as an adjunct to your ART. That is um, – yeah. Because of the time it might take to get the constitution of pathogen specific immunity, I think it'd just be too yeah. much risk no, I, to, uh, to, was, to not give an antibody. Right, all of the all of the international and other guidelines for right. opportunistic inf- infections would not suggest that you wait for antiretroviral therapy to to kick in. But it's actually a fascinating question that might have been that, that retrospectively such cases might have been identified in uh, the art rollout in Africa by going back to baseline samples, finding people who had positive cryptoantigens and were never treated and then are fine on HIV therapy. And I wish David Bulwari were on the panel. David, well, there have, he actually has done a little bit of that. Um, I wouldn't say it's a broad scale study, but there are many other follow-ons to his original work with this to suggest that in fact, people who don't get preemptive therapy and just either get started on ART or don't, don't do well. Yeah. So I think the the goal here is to evaluate them for uh, cryptococcal meningitis, and if that's not present, to start them on fluconazole therapy. And it might be worth just mentioning that even though this is new to our guidelines and in places where these studies have been done, uh, Serum cryptococcal antigen has been part of, for example, the South African guidelines uh, for some time yeah. now, uh, because for the reasons that have been already uh, right. talked about. So um, this is something that in, in places where um, crypto is very common, they've been doing for some years now. So. Okay, thanks. That that was uh, that was fun. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is CD4 counts. Um, so I just want to ask the panel about how they feel about not measuring CD4 counts after they're stable above 250 for a year. Um, does it make anybody anxious? I know that it makes some of times it makes my patients anxious and we have to have talks. Yeah. Although I've been, I've been impressed at how patients have accommodated. Um, to not doing CD4, uh, testing. At first, I, I think they were really nervous about it. Um, we had trained them so well to, to have us for every visit. Um, but I think they've relaxed as, as we have, I think. It's like predefining undetectable is less than 200. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I think patients that are starting are, you know, now are starting in an area that we're not doing this. The problem is a patient who's been a long patient of ours, 
and who's been used to doing this. I and mean, you have to sort of get comfortable with them and educate them. That is not necessary, but a lot of times they, it's almost like they want to know, you know, they have this, I have this one guy that writes it in a spreadsheet and he wants that number to put in his spreadsheet, makes him feel good. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But I, I do think that an interesting topic here, and again, this, you know, uh, we're talking to a more international audience is, as you know, in many, uh, Many of the PEPFAR programs they have stopped doing even even uh, TD4 counts at start of therapy, and it's yeah. a lot of it a budgetary issue. And I'm I'm totally against that. I think it's a, it's good to have a CD4 count at, at, at baseline, and we have said that. And I want to be sure that people remember that that we're not saying that don't do them at baseline. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it goes back to what you know. I think almost all of us were taught when we were in in medical school or training, and that is, if you're going to order a test, you have to ask the question, how are you going to use the result? And so to your point, Carlos, when somebody comes in new, it's critical to know what their CD4 count is. It, it directs everything from even getting a cryptococcal antigen. Who, who would have thought it? But, but so that we use. But I think the whole point of this is that once somebody's been on established therapy, their viral load has been uh, suppressed, consistently, and their CD4 count now is, is above um, the threshold, the, it usually stays there. And even if it dips a little bit, that's not an issue of, uh, quote, immune um, uh, activity trouble. It's usually that the white count has dropped down a little bit or the percent lymphocyte, but it's not really an indication of immunologic failure like we used to call it. So, um it's it's not only just a waste of money. It, it, there's nothing we do with the result. Yeah. So, Dr. Benson, can can you talk a little bit about maybe how um, how we use CD4 counts and looking for opportunistic infections um, while somebody's suppressed? Do we need to worry so much about CD4 counts and OIs? Well, I think you've kind of. Uh alluded to the answer to this question there. Once they're consistently above 200, I think you're pretty well out of the the realm of where you need to monitor CD4 counts for OIs. The, uh, the bulk of the OIs that we see all occur in the context of people with CD4 counts of well under 200. And, uh, as you know, for many of the OIs, there's no longer a recommendation even for primary prophylaxis if you can get people on adequate antiretroviral therapy and fully suppressed, regardless of what the CD4 count is. There are ample data to support that recommendation for mycobacterium avium complex and for pneumocystis pneumonia. And so those recommendations are starting to go by the wayside for primary prophylaxis. I think um, even the other OIs that we've talked about being sort of exceptions, cryptococcal meningitis and tuberculosis um, for CD4 counts that are well above 250 consistently and stay there on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, you've accomplished what you need to accomplish in terms of immune reconstitution and response to OI treatment. So... <clears throat> Unless someone's failing therapy and unable to continue viral suppression, there's no need to continue monitoring CD4 counts. Yeah, there was a, thank you. There was a question in the chat about, is there a difference between a 250 and 500? Should we really be worried about those two different numbers when somebody's suppressed? You know, maybe I'll no, I don't comment that, so. yeah, that, it is probably true that people whose CD4 count gets stuck in the, you know, 100, 200 range, um, despite virologic suppression, that there's something about them probably lower, I mean, by definition, lower native CD4 count to begin with that makes them immunologically, they probably have more, a bit more activation. There's probably more non-infectious complications in those individuals. But as I think Dr. Sachs said, there's not anything we can do about it. There's not, uh, we, we know that we tried uh, interleukin-2 and we raised their CD4 counts, but it just didn't do anything in terms of clinical outcomes. And so, you know, in the future, uh, when people, as they study inflammation and these non-infectious complications of HIV, I think that's a group immunologically that's of interest. Having a low CD4 count persistently despite virologic suppression um, does have an impact on health, but it's not something that's remediable right now. And it's uh, really a topic of research. 
which is why I don't think we need to keep checking it for clinical purposes. So. There's also a, a, a comment in the chat that I wanted to address that sometimes if a person has a low CD4 cell count um, and is having difficulty with adherence, that it's if the CD4 drops, it's a kind of good way to reinforce adherence. And I would just want to underscore that if they're still virally suppressed, uh, we wouldn't be changing treatment uh, based on that. It'd be solely a matter of, uh, of kind of explaining, you know, it's important for you to adhere to your therapy. Glad you're, you're interested in doing so. Good news, your viral load is still suppressed. The fall in the CD4 may represent uh, just random occurrence of the assay uh, rather than anything that we really can take. We don't want to switch therapy based on that. And we really don't want to switch therapy based on CD4 counts alone. I've uh, proposed to one of my um, long-term patients who has a great sense of humor that he still wants his CD4 cell count measured, even though he knows it's not going to change treatment. So I said to him, what if I used a program, a spreadsheet to generate a random number between 500 and 700 every time you come in and I just hit that button and give you that as your number <laughs> rather than actually measuring the CD4? And he, he agreed that that would be just as good. <laughs> yeah, it's better to continue copy and pasting the last result. Right, right. <laughs> No, I mean, we're all saying the same thing, but I just tell my patients, you know, we have a medicine for HIV, but we don't have a medicine for CD4 cells. We, just, we, we can't treat it. Why measure? Yeah, there's there's also a, a nice comment in the chat, which I've also battled with some ADAP programs still requiring CD4 counts for continued coverage. And hopefully we can, this is one good thing that perhaps guidelines can help with Absolutely. is that uh, they can get those those guidelines, those ADAP um requirements and other insurance requirements change. Yeah, I, looked into that. I looked into that a little bit, Davey, and it really has to happen in the U.S. anyway, if it hadn't happened in the HHS guidelines. So if they adopt this, then HRSA gets a green light to change their recommendations. Cool. I just also wanted to touch real quickly on any other immunosuppression. So if we have someone who has HIV but it's very well suppressed, but then they go on, other immunosuppressives, does that change anything that we'd want to do on CD4 count side? My, my general I, thought, go ahead. Again, as I think uh, Paul Volberding said, we don't have a, a way to to treat the CD4 count, or that is, um, we wouldn't change anything about our antiretroviral regimen, uh, even if they went on fliximab or some other Regimen would worry and make sure that they're up to date on screening for you know latent infections, but I don't think the CD4 count would help us even in terms of measuring it. So. Agreed. I, I've just seen some cases where people didn't put on PCP prophylaxis when someone who had CLL and HIV or other things. So just keep that in the back of the mind that people get more than one thing, and sometimes those prophylaxis sort of blur. Okay, let's switch over to uh, viral load measures. Um, mm. So how often do people get viral loads um, at the start? Is a month too soon, too, too about right? Or should we go two months, three months? Anybody, anybody have any thoughts on that after starting therapy? Well, I, I like to get the patient to come back within four weeks or so, maybe six weeks at the latest, just to see how they're doing, see, look for side effects, um, evaluate for any iris if it might be going on, but it's also a good time to check the viral load. And uh, it takes a you know a couple of days to get it back, but a follow up phone call to them that says, "Hey, we got your viral load back, and it's really come down," is really um, reinforcing to the patient about adherence. Sometimes, of course, it hadn't come down, and that's a whole other conversation. But uh, it's a very important thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's very important. But, but those are those are uh, visits where you could probably do it just as well on the phone or or, or on video, um, which we're all doing now anyway. So uh, but I like to check it as well. But uh, you know, when you've just seen a patient a month ago, unless unless they're complaining of a horrible new headache, um, unlikely you're going to see anything by seeing them in person. And I'll interrupt us just to welcome uh, Drs. Molina and Landovitz. Welcome. Uh, they're going to be talking to us a lot about PrEP here in just a little bit, but we'll talk maybe before we get to their section about PrEP monitoring that you showed earlier, Davey, but let's continue on. 
So on the, yeah, welcome to the team. Um, so uh, just along the lines of when and where to measure, or how to measure, and the anxiety attached to measuring viral loads. So if, if somebody has a decrease in their viral loads four weeks after you start, let's say, an integrase-based uh, regimen, Mike, do you, but they're not undetectable yet. Uh, how, what, what do you say to them? Well, I, I try to briefly just kind of go into some of the biology about what, what's happening. You know, you don't go into like with a, a slide set or something, but at least to explain why this is happening and, and that it will take a little bit of time, but almost always it's headed in the right direction. And as we talked about earlier, some people never make it to undetectable, and that's okay. We just have to explain that along the way. But, but addressing anxiety is very important because this is – Brand new for folks are kind of nervous. Uh, they want to be successful with it. And, uh, I think that's just all part of not only the dialogue, but establishing trust. Okay. And then after somebody's been suppressed for a year, we, we're saying you don't need to measure viral loads so often anymore. Anybody have any patient, uh, anxieties around that or own personal <laughs> anxieties around those guidelines? I would, I would just say that the, uh, the opposite is true for some of our real veterans of taking ART and they think twice a year is crazy. Um, you know, and they, they, they will, you can bring them in yearly. Um, and that's important, you know, to continue to monitor them. And there are other things you want to monitor people for in addition to just HIV, especially if you're their primary care clinician. But, but if someone has had viral suppression since 1997, and you're measuring it every six months, one could easily make the argument that that's too often. And, and uh, so, so, so I think people earn less frequent viral load measurement over time. You, it's not the kind of thing we can put in guidelines, but it is something that you can do in clinical practice. That, that's, that's very helpful. Anybody, what about virologic failure? If somebody comes back with a 200 uh, viral loads, they've been suppressed for two years and it comes back at 200. What do, what do you do then, Paul? Either, either Paul. <laughs> uh, panic a little bit, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, the obvious things uh, are, and, and I think these are nicely addressed in the, in the guidelines is um, really kind of drill down on adherence issues. Um, I think it's the most likely uh, cause, but also uh, drug, drug interactions, you know, are there food restrictions that are not being followed? Are there, uh, cation restrictions that are not being followed, um, the, the, you know, the low-hanging fruit of, of some of these. Uh, but, you know, fortunately, true breakthroughs with the current regimens are extremely rare, um, and especially, if, obviously, especially if the person is adherent. And then once we get, let's say, two, let's say they're 200, and then we measure it, and, you know, we recheck it, and it's now... 5,000, um, we're going to do a bar, we're going to do a resistance testing at that time. And then <clears throat> now I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball on this question is that we, 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 we do the genotype, we send it off for the genotype and it keeps coming back inconclusive. I mean, who all would do a proviral test at that time? I haven't done that. No. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing the proviral test only in people whose viral load is suppressed. Um, I think, I, I guess I haven't seen a lot of inconclusive. Sometimes I've seen wild side, which makes me worried they're not taking their, their medicines. But um, I thought what you were going to say is one of the, well, one thing that disturbs me to this day is where we order it, you can't get an, you have to order the integrase genotype separate from the um, RT and the protease. And I, you know, I think um, that leads to, problems if you don't um, send that because mostly people are failing if they're on the first line regimen they're often on an integrase inhibitor um, I thought you were going to ask the controversial somewhat controversial question about should we be doing genotypes uh, some uh, people including Paul Sachs are on a paper saying that we should that it's not cost effective to be doing RT and, and uh, protease genotypes anymore uh, even for initial therapy although I think most of us in the guidelines still recommend doing it um, uh, it's there are many things we do that may not turn out to be cost effective, but we find it useful information anyway. Uh, I don't know, Paul, do you, do you still do RT and PR genotypes despite it's hard, hard to show that it's cost effective? Yeah. I mean, 
it's it's hard to wean yourself from something that you've been doing for years. And what I can tell you is we still do it and we get the results back and we find it interesting when someone has transmitted resistance, but it has not changed our management in anyone since we started using Dolotegravir and Bictegravir based regimens. So uh, at some point we probably should readdress this practice pattern, but we're still ordering them. David, you were asking about inconclusive. Have, have you had either experience with that or adopted, adopted an approach around proviral gene types? Or do you want to say when you do do proviral gene types? Yeah, I, I've just seen it in practice and I've done it a couple of times or recommended it a couple of times. And people have, it's usually less than 5,000 copies that sometimes they can't get a good genotype. And in that setting, people and I have also turned to a proviral at that, that time. But, um, it's definitely not common, but it's a common question that people get. Um, but yeah, then I was going to talk about the controversy of resistance testing at baseline. I know that the CDC, <clears throat> excuse me, is looking at the respond pillar for the ending the HIV epidemic, and they actually use those genotype data for the molecular epi. And uh, I'm just wondering if anybody has any thoughts, if we, if that's a, still a good reason to to continue getting those baseline genotypes. <laughs> it's a reason. <laughs> it's a reason, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cost, it's cost, it's cost shifting. It's, it's paying for surveillance data using people's insurance, uh, and other, uh, payers. So it's rather than a, a federally funded or CDC funded program to pay for the tests. It's using people's insurance to pay for the tests. And, and it's a little, it's a little weird. <laughs> One other point that I wanted to make that uh, in the time of COVID, has anybody seen any decrease in the amount of lab monitoring of their patients? And is that becoming a problem? And um, anybody have any advice? Yeah, it is. It is a problem in the sense that if, especially Several months ago, when we were doing a boatload of telemedicine visits, the patients weren't coming in for their labs. And um, I, I don't know of many uh, casualties of that. Uh, we'd have to look back. But I, it made me uncomfortable uh, that we weren't monitoring like we normally did. And um, people are starting to come back in for their visits now, so we're getting labs. But that, I don't know if other people were seeing the same thing. I, I, think, I think the other issue that was going on, uh, uh, Michael is, uh, you know, our, our PCR machines were so busy doing COVID that there were not enough reagents to do the other testing. So they were sort of leaving behind. They were sort of like postponing to do later their viral loads. And that's still an issue, not so much anymore, but it's an issue still with swabs. When we get to prep and talk about STD testing, I mean, STD testing has become, we're going back to getting people to tell them, you know, a recommendation of, of syndromic management of STD because we can't get STD testing because there's not enough swabs. They're all being used for nasal swabs. And we started sending out uh, viral loads uh, because of the COVID influx. And that's what I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, the lab ended up with a higher number of barely, de but, but detectable um, viral loads because of that shift, that, which was definitely COVID related. So we've, we've hit the, Tom, I want to thank uh, Dr. Smith for leading us through a great discussion. There's still some questions that are in the Q&A box that we'll try to address uh, through typewritten answers. But let, I would like to segue now to our prevention section. We've got 30 minutes on the clock. Uh, we have our uh, lead faculty who are going to take us through it, Dr. Landovitz, Dr. Uh, Bookbinder, and Dr. Molina. So we'll turn it over to you and the panel will be weighing in. Use us liberally. Um, Rafi, I think you're going to kick us off. 